All right, so what do you think this chapter is about? Batteries. Batteries, yeah. Okay. All right, so the deal is the following. And lithium-ion batteries are not going to solve this problem. Okay, they're way too expensive. So if you want a 100% renewable energy future, um, and... Uh, So uh, it would be solar, wind. Many people are making mistakes on not having nuclear, okay, plus storage, which are batteries. Okay. Right now, lithium ion is a solution we have, which is too expensive. So I was, and um, I can send you an article if you guys uh, send me an email or I'll post it on the website. For the U.S. to go 80% renewable, at current prices, batteries, lithium-ion batteries would cost two and a half trillion dollars. Yeah. That's a little expensive. So, but of course, I mean, that's, prices are going to change and there are other solutions going, going to happen. I mean, I'm sure you guys will, like I said, you guys want to become multi-billionaires. You want to become the richest person on the planet, come up with a good, cheap battery, okay? So, um, this is Musk. Battery cell production is the fundamental rate limiter, slowing down a sustainable energy future, okay? Is so that Elon Musk? That's Elon Musk. <coughs> Well, it's like in in golf, you don't have to say Tiger Woods, you just have to say Tiger. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, in technology, it's Musk, all right. <laughs> so it is a problem, okay? And uh, so because uh, we all know which are the, which are the cheapest source to produce electricity? Solar and wind. Yeah. Right. This thing far outweighs the cost of production. Yeah. So, um, but, so we have to come up with uh, uh, a nice cheap way of storing uh, energy. Okay, I hope this thing is also in our future, but anyway. All right, so that's what we're going to talk about, storage today. Uh, now, before we go into that, let me remind you how electricity is produced, uh, how we produce electricity. Okay, so there we go. Uh, this is a generator. There's a magnet. You guys have seen this. And you just have to figure out a way to turn this uh, piece of wire in between the magnet. It takes energy to do that. Okay, and so whatever device you come up with, well, okay. So lithium ion batteries, those would be different. So one way to store energy would be, the idea is the following. Uh, the idea is the following. Let's say, um, so when does storage happen? You're producing, you're producing more, energy, electricity, using wind and sol solar, than you're using. Okay. And the excess you store for a rainy day. It's like, uh, you know, it's like economics. You're, you're making more money than you're spending. What do you do? The rest you put in the bank, okay, for a rainy day. Yeah. And so today, here's, and we'll talk about this, 90% of the storage in the world today is the following. So whenever you produce excess electricity, what you do is you take water and pump it up there. Okay? And when you want the electricity, you, this is your dam. You pass it through a generator and you produce electricity. Did you guys understand that? Yeah. Uh -oh, what's that? 
yep, it's on a loop. And so you bring it back, very good. And whenever you have excess electricity, you produce, pump it up there, and then you release this water to produce electricity when you need it. Okay, 90% of the storage in the world is this. This is cheap storage, and uh, if you have enough of this, then the world could switch to renewables, but you know, you don't have enough locations for that. Yeah. And the good thing about this is, okay, when you put money in the bank, how much money do you get back? Yeah, how many? You get 100% back. Okay, very good. Here you get 80% back, but we're happy as a pig with that. Okay, so this is a good, cheap technology. Yeah. So that's essentially the storage right now. Do yeah. you guys understand? Okay. But, you know, to globally switch, we have to come up with a, with a good battery storage uh, solution. And um, I don't know the exact number, but uh, do you guys remember uh, how much how much do you need to run the world if you're completely running on solar and wind, completely running the world on electricity? Twelve thousand gigawatts. Very good, very good. I love you guys. Okay, and you know. Presumably so. So now if you ask how much batteries do you need, you probably, again, this is the number I, I was trying to look. So you probably need about 2,500 gigawatts, maybe 10 to 20% of your production capacity, you know, to be able to store for probably several hours, you know, maybe at least 10 hours. So I would imagine 25,000 gigawatt hour. What this means is you can produce, you can run 2,500 Hoover dams for 10 hours, okay? That's the storage you need. You use up the storage and then recharge it during excess times and stuff like that, okay? So that would be the problem. And uh, right now, to build that kind of stuff, lithium ion would be too expensive, okay? All right, so again, we want to go to 100% renewable future, yep. but again, like uh, a, very, a fairly smart businessman, technology says uh, this is a this is a tough problem. Okay, so here are two qualities. One is looking for energy storage. You want to be able to store large amounts of energy, okay, and cheaply. Yeah, of course, if it's too expensive, nobody's going to do it. And you want fast response time. What does that mean? Like when you need it. Yep, right. So electricity has to be produced right when you need it, okay? So it's like if you put money in the bank, you can draw it, withdraw it fast. You put it in real estate, you can't withdraw it fast, okay? All right. This technology, this is fairly fast. You can get your money back within five minutes, okay? So you pump water up there and you want electricity. So for instance, during the day, uh, around noon and stuff like that, electricity demand peaks and stuff, okay? And then you can withdraw it fast, okay? Right now, what we are doing, when you want fast response, what you're doing is you have these natural gas plants you fire natural gas, and those are called peaker plants. So you have these large plants that are only working one or two hours a day. Okay. But if you have a cheap storage facility, then that would be a ch cheaper way to go. Okay. All right, so you want, so in your storage, you want two qualities. You want to be able to store large amounts and uh, as fast a response time as possible, okay? Now here's the deal. Faster the response time, more expensive the storage technology. Okay. Okay, so hydro storage, how fast can it give you back your money? Within five minutes, okay? Now, there is a superconducting 
storage technology that can give you back your money in milliseconds. Again, that can give you back your money instantly. And it can store large amounts. What's the catch? It's expensive. <laughs> yeah. All right. But there are situations when you're willing to, uh, willing to pay the money. Uh, so for instance, all the bankers, they never want their servers to go down. There are hospital applications where you want uh, uninterrupted power supply and stuff like that. Okay? So you're willing to pay that money. OK. So we're going to talk about storage. So here is a large bank of lithium ion batteries. Okay. So it's necessary because energy is not always produced when needed and where it's needed. Okay, so this is true for renewable energy sources. Wind, wind energy is intermittent and, conjunct, and in conjunction with storage can provide power as needed. Okay, so that's the goal. So here is the global situation uh, currently. Okay. Um, okay, so let me give you the big number. Okay, as of today, uh, pumped hydropower, pumped hydropower is this, this hydropower. Okay, pumped hydropower, you have a tank below and you're a tank above. When you produce excess electricity, you pump up water and then release the water when you need the energy later. Okay, so pumped hydropower, how much of it is there? Okay. There's 160 Hoover dams worth of it, okay? And can store up to 9,000 gigawatt hours. Okay, what does that mean, gigawatt hours? For one hour, uh, well, okay, so it can produce 160 gigawatt. So if you divide 9,000 gigawatt, let's make sure you understand this. 160 gigawatts, okay? So you have these 150 Hoover dams operating, okay? And 150 divided by, that's uh, 60 hours, okay? So these Hoover dams can operate for 60 hours, okay? So that's how much storage we have, okay? Well, what does this do, okay? See. I mean, in one perspective, this is kind of nice. This can almost run the world for one hour. Remember, all you need is, if you're producing electricity, you need 12,000 gigawatts to run the world. So essentially, that's what you can do. Okay? But again, this storage is not enough to do to completely, not even close to completely switch to wind and solar. So for instance, um, if you, I'll post this article, for instance, in California, most of the wind and solar is produced in, in the summer. You have wind and solar in the summer. In the winter months, you, you don't have as much. And then what do you do? You're, you need a storage that will store energy for several months. Okay? Pumped hydropower can do it, except that in California, you don't have the pumped hydro storage facilities. You guys understanding all of this? Yes? No? All right. Because remember, when you become president, you got to solve this problem. Yep. <coughs> I have a question. You might sound stupid. Okay. But like... All your comments have been pretty good so far. <laughs> well, this one might not be. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So say, you know, the Earth is here, and here's us, and here's like... In the nighttime mm -hmm. on the other side. Right. So if we have solar here, mm -hmm. they don't need it when they're at night, right? Not solar power, but like they don't need as much power at night. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing. So if we have excess, can mm -hmm. we just. Yeah, that's too expensive to draw expensive. wire. Yeah. yeah. You want. It's cheaper to find a local solution. Right, so it's, there's no way to like have the solar always going for the world, if you get what I'm saying? Yeah, so what you, yeah, no, I mean, you just uh, have solar panels during your day and charge your batteries, okay, just find cheaper batteries right. for the night. And there's no 
other way to like loop the excess, I guess you could say? Um. So I don't know how far you can go, but uh, I. S not with the not with the earth, but like say we have a plant here and we have excess. Instead of using batteries, we can't like loop it a different. So so here's the so they're going to put power plants, solar and wind power plants in Morocco. And they're using underwater cables to send the power to uh, England. Right. Mm -hmm. So 3,000 miles, I suppose they're doing that. They're covering that. Economically, today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's not, I mean, it's, it's not, but it's not. No, it's not expensive. It's, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's cheaper than coal, I guess. So again, uh, you know, I mean, all this will happen. I'm very, you know, optimistic and your future looks good. It's just that, you know, the faster we get there, the better. That's all. Okay, so global energy storage. Okay, right now, 90% is pumped hydro. Okay. Okay. So, uh, molten salt, do you guys remember that? See, that can grow. That is cheap. Do you guys remember what that is? What is it? <coughs> right, very good. So that's, uh, so that's a good solution too, okay? Uh, so again, you have mirrors and uh, you melt salt from sunlight during the day, and this thing can store energy for several hours. Okay? So that's a good technology as well. So if you're living in the, in where it's plenty sunny, so that's a good technology. You can do that. Okay, I'm sure so. And that's much cheaper than lithium ion, so that'll grow. We'll talk about flywheels. Flywheels are, you just take a massive object and spin it, okay, using excess electricity. And then you can use that to produce electricity later when you need it. Okay, again, that's a small solution. Okay, uh, so uh, lithium-ion batteries, uh, uh, again, they're expensive, but they're good. So we'll have to come up with other battery solutions. Okay. China's operational energy storage capacity total thirty-two gigawatts. So again, gigawatt is a Hoover Dam, so thirty-two Hoover Dams worth. So the world is that much, one-sixth of the world's capacity is in China. Okay. So according to Bloomberg, uh, around the world, so um, again, storage capacity by 2050, uh, 2040. Our goal is to be completely renewable by 2050. Okay. So will storage capacity will grow up to 1,000 gigawatts. A thousand who were damned. Okay. And on the average, each, this storage will be able to store energy for three hours. That's what that means. Okay. A thousand times three is three thousand gigawatt hour. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. So this a hundredfold boom of energy storage will uh, require about $600 billion. Okay. So again, what we're looking for is the cheapest path forward. Okay. That's what the market always does. Okay. I mean, it has to be sensible too. You can't, you know, you can't. All right, so, so what we're going to talk about is pumped hydro s storage. Okay, so again, here's the model. You have a, a reservoir at a lower level, and uh, in there's one in the in West Virginia in the U.S. I don't know if anybody's seen this facility, but we'll talk about that. And you have a tank up there. So when you have excess electricity, when the bl wind is blowing hard and uh, uh, the sun is shining, you pump the whatever electricity you're not using. You use that to pump the water up. And then when you need electricity later on, you pump it down and uh, 
produce electricity. What's good thing about this? This is a well-known technology. It's cheap. And how long can you store this energy? Uh, as long as you want. Okay. And so, you know, this is cheap technology and you get 80% of your money back. So you lose only 20% in, in the various transactions. Yep. Uh, we'll, okay, so large scale electricity storage methods such as pumped hydro will be covered in this chapter. Batteries we'll talk about in the next chapter. Hydrogen is, here's the elephant in the room. This can be a way to store energy. How do you store energy there? So you take water, you use electricity to split it. Okay, and this is, this is your stored energy. Okay, and then you learn about this in chapter 20. You can use this in fuel cells. to produce electricity. Okay. And you know you can store hydrogen for as long as you want. Okay, so that's another cheap solution. And that's coming. So uh, where are you getting this electricity from? Solar and wind. Okay. So, and actually the Japanese are betting on the hydrogen technology. Okay. And, uh, this also return is, uh, you can get up to 80% return or something like that. Okay. So here is a cheap solution as well. Okay. So we'll talk about this uh, uh, later. Okay. All right, so again, pump storage hydroelectricity, PSH, you'll see this in article. Systems have low level reservoirs and high level reservoirs. So water is pumped to an elevated reservoir during periods of low demand using excess electricity. Electricity is generated from the potential energy of the stored water during periods of high demand. So globally, there's 160 gigawatt. Okay, so you can produce electricity back at the rate of 160, 60 Hoover dams, and you saw that that translates to 60 hours worth of worth of stuff. Okay. 60 hours worth of electricity. So I mean, this thing can. Uh, so currently, pump storage is the world's largest battery technology, accounting for 90% of the grid scale installed capacity. China has uh, 31 Hoover dams worth of stuff. We have about 23 Hoover dams worth of stuff, and. Uh, Okay, Norway is a good place for it, but you know, they have enough for themselves. They can't be, the, they, were, they were going to be Europe's batteries, but it didn't quite work out. All right. So pumped hydroelectric facilities, so this kind of facilities, there's 350 of them in the world, and see, there are all those places where they are. Okay. In the U.S., the largest facility is in Bath County, Virginia. It provides three Hoover dams worth of electricity for up to 10 hours. Okay. So that's the largest facility. Uh, so a major advantage of pumped hydroelectric power is response time. Uh, the Bath County station can bring 400 megawatts online in just six minutes. So let's say suddenly, I mean, I don't know, you start a whole bunch of company factories or whatever. This is half a Hoover Dam. It can come online in six minutes. That's pretty good. <clears throat> Again, remember, you had to produce electricity just as you're using it, okay? So if demand goes up and stuff, 
like I said, you switch off a light, that much production went down. You switch on lights, that much production went up. Yep. Mm -hmm. So how far is the reach for the 11 hours? Like, is that the whole United States that can power for 11 hours? Or is that just no, 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 no. No, it can provide this much, uh, 500 megawatts. Uh, no, no, no. No, 3 gigawatts for 11 hours. Yeah. So, so 30 gigawatt hour. Is it? Okay, so if you're using it at uh, one gigawatt, so you're running it as one Hoover Dam, then you can run for 33 hours, and so on. Okay. So that's why you have to be careful. At what rate can you produce? So this is the maximum rate at which you can produce power, and then at this rate, you can power for 60 hours. So if you're using only 80 gigawatts, then you can power for 120 hours and so on. That's the world capacity. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. So again, here's another. So we already saw this. Um, uh, globally, there are two, 350 such facilities you find a lake at a low altitude and a lake at a high altitude. You use excess energy from renewable sources to run these things. In the United States, pumped hydroelectricity capacity re represents about 2.5% of the base load generating capacity. Okay, so what that means is uh, if there's 100 Hoover dams worth of uh, worth of electricity generation facilities, including coal, everything, pumped hydro can provide 2.5 gigawatts. That's what that means. Okay. I guess Europe has a better geography, more highs and lows, and so they have 5.5% of the pumped hydro. Okay. So we have a lot more flat land. Are there more tectonic plate boundaries over in Europe, or is that like evenly distributed between the whole See, there is your plate. No? Oh, yeah. All right. So there is the facility in Virginia. Okay. Um, so the advantages are the advantages are their efficient technology. You get back your eighty percent of your money that you put in. It's it's an old, reliable technology. Costs are very low. Operation and operating and maintenance costs are very low, and you know fairly quick response time. Okay. And energy can be stored for as long as you need. Okay. So, okay, the power you can produce. Uh, okay, so let's say you want high power. The power, this is flow rate, how much water is, the rate at which the water is flowing, times the height. Okay, so you want high power, you better find a lake and a high mountain. Okay, and then, you know, so the higher the mountain you have the lake on, then you can have low flow rate and still produce high power. Okay, so that's the deal. All right, so pumped storage, hydro storage is a good uh, technology. It's cheap. It's very reliable. Okay. And if that's, that would be our first option. If you can find that, then that's the one we'll go to. Okay. Here's another way to do it. Okay, so you have excess electricity. If you have a 
airtight chamber, large airtight chamber, you just pump air in and compress air in there. Okay. And then when you need the electricity, you pump, let the air go back out and turn a turbine and produce electricity. Okay. So you, you use the compressed air to, where is that thing? Where did I lose my, Why isn't thing showing me the Okay, so you use the compressed air to turn that piece of wire. Okay. All right, so again, the idea uh, you use uh, excess electricity to uh, run a compressor and compress air. And then when you need the electricity back, you take this compressed air and turn your tur turbine. Um, okay, so, so, and you use that to generate during peak hours. Okay, now, it, apparently depleted salt caverns are good facilities. Okay. And the amount of energy stored depends on the pressure difference. Okay, so how high can you compress the air pressure to. This is the final pressure, and the initial pressure is uh, atmospheric pressure. So this tells you how much energy you can store per unit volume. Okay, now there's only two small facilities that have been running in the world. Uh, there's one in Germany, which produces a third of a Hoover Dam worth. So uh, this is megawatt of electricity. So it can produce 300 megawatts of electricity. And it's been operation in operation since 78. And there's one in Alabama which can produce 100 megawatts of electricity. Okay, 100 meg megawatts, uh, so you can a, ta a thousand watts of electricity can run a barely run a U.S. home. So you, we're talking about a hundred thousand U.S. homes. You can run. Okay. Again, as you can see, these are all niche solutions. You're not running. You're not solving world problems with this. Global problems with this. Okay. But uh, we'll come to compressed air in a second. Okay. So they have performed very well for many years. Uh, and so this is a reliable technology. Okay. So we know how it works, we can operate it. This is, uh, so this will uh, hopefully be a good solution in the future. Uh, offshore winds is a good reliable source of energy. And so you can use offshore windmills to have these tanks underwater and compress air there and store energy there. So look at the dimensions of these tanks. That's 30 meters. So this tank is as big as this building. Okay. So you can use excess electricity to compress air, store that store that energy and again you can store that for a long time okay you really want to be you want you really want a cheap technology to be able to store for you know three four days and stuff like that yeah. well sometimes you might need longer storage but anyway so this is a very feasible technology and uh, right now in the u.s we are pursuing offshore winds quite a bit um, they are coming up with floating wind farms Okay. And so this facility can be very good and useful. Okay. Flywheels, what you do is you take a heavy object and get it spinning. How do you get it spinning? Using excess electricity. Okay. And uh, so hopefully this won't slow down. When will it not slow down? What will slow down a spinning wheel? friction so you want to minimize friction okay and so here's a i mean here's a sort of an expensive flywheel see 
these magnets have them floating and so the these flywheels are not touching anything only air is slowing them down so you spin them fast using excess electricity and then you use the spin later to turn that piece of wire to produce okay so um, what you want to spin is the uh, ring is what okay so the energy stored is something called the moment of inertia of the spinning object times its angular speed square so you want to store a lot of energy you want this number to be as large as possible and that thing is highest for a ring the moment of inertia okay for a given mass okay well how much energy can you store practical limits for a flywheel energy storage capacity is about a hundred kilowatt hour so a kilowatt you can run a u.s home so you can run 100 homes for one hour this this would be the world's largest flywheel okay. again this is um, not a very you're not going to run the world on flywheels but there are applications for this so you can have a whole bank of flywheels okay um, Storing a reasonable amount of energy would require a very large flywheel rotating at very high speed or many small flywheels as shown in the picture. Okay. Each of these flywheels, a disc of steel with a diameter of 0.85 meters, 0.85 meters is this much, so a flywheel this big, big, rotates at an angular speed of 40 radians. So this is the same as the energy is contained in the wheel of a freight train traveling at 100 km an hour so you've seen trains and the wheels rotating on the wheel when the train is going there that's how much energy there is in these guys okay. they're compact and efficient uh, small capacity and losses due to friction they lose about one percent of their energy per hour okay so potential use is short-term backup to even out power fluctuations due to variability of AC sources yeah. and again this is a very small market only about 300 million okay. so but some of these companies do use them so data centers uh, uh, financial institutions and stuff like that okay and uh, anyway so here's one way to do it Okay, now we'll talk about the superconducting energy storage. Okay. Uh, this is the most expensive storage, but it has the fastest response time, millisecond response time. Okay. And this thing also, you can store the energy as long as you want. Okay. So there is no loss, essentially. And you can get back whatever you put in. You can get back 90% five percent of what you put in okay. and the idea is the following so this is a battery and here's a ring shaped uh, wire so if you pass a current through this battery what it does is uh, it produces, um, now I'm going to draw a side view. Here's a side view of the ring. And if a current is passing through it, it produces magnetic fields. Um, magnetic fields are denoted. This is magnetic fields. It's just like a, if you have a bar magnet, it produces magnetic fields like that, okay? And energy is stored in this magnetic field. When you want to draw the energy back, you can use this electricity and pass it through your washing machine or whatever. And as the current dies, this thing dies. So you've drawn out all that energy. Now, the thing is the following. You need something where the current can flow without friction. If you pass the current in an ordinary wire, it'll just get turned into heat right away. 
almost instantly, and you're not storing energy. If you take a superconducting wire, this current can flow for years without decaying. Okay, so that's a way to store energy. And that's the idea. Okay. So, uh, the thing is now, to, for the wire to be superconducting, you have to maintain it very cold. Okay, so now there are technologies where you can use liquid nitrogen to keep it cold enough. Okay, and liquid nitrogen costs about 10, 10 cents a liter okay, or less. And so that's what you're spending your money on, keeping the wire cold while the current is flowing in. Did you guys understand that? Okay. Okay. So here is the acronym. Superconducting mag magnetic energy storage is a method of energy storage based, based on superconducting wires, resistanceless current flow in a superconductor. Energy stored in the form of magnetic fields. Energy is stored in the form of magnetic fields. Okay. The stored energy can be released by discharging the coil, meaning using the current for whatever it is you want to do. Efficiencies are very high. In addition, SMA can switch from full discharge to full charge very, very quickly. Okay, You can charge it up very fast and discharge it very fast. Okay, So, okay. Um, so, they include three parts, superconducting coil, power, power conditioning system, and cryogenically cooled refrigerators. You have to cool the wires. Okay. So once you store the energy, the current will not decay, and the magnetic energy can be stored forever, okay. so as long as you want. You can get back 95% of the energy. Okay. So this is the most eff efficient way of storing energy, except that it's expensive. Okay. Okay. So the energy required for refrigeration, remember to keep the wire cold is where you're spending your money, to maintain the coil below the superconducting transition temperature is typically of the order of 0.1% of the energy stored in the coil per hour of storage. Okay. So for every $100, of energy stored, you're spending 0.1% uh, so what, 10 cents per hour. Okay. So, advantages of SMA, yes, there are several. Power is almost available almost instantaneously within milliseconds. And very high power output can be provided for brief periods. Okay. So you can draw the power very fast. So for some reason, you know, well, to use a financial analogy, let's say Bill Gates goes someplace and he wants to buy a billion dollar piece of art and he has to buy it immediately. Not many banks will be able to offer that. This thing can. Okay. There won't be many times you'll need it, but if you need it, it can. So, for instance, uh, if you want to turn on a large power, uh, large manufacturing facility, this thing can provide that energy. So, other storage methods such as pumped hydro and compressed air, I mean, those can respond within five, six minutes, but that's a long time compared to these guys. These, can, these guys can respond within milliseconds, except that the costs are higher. Yes, setting it up and maintaining it. Uh, no, once maintenance cost or not that high. The so like once you purchase it, you're going to get your money back regardless. Yeah, it'll last a long time. It's just that you need expertise to maintain it. Okay, okay so here's an ad additional. The main parts in SMEs are, uh, SMES are motionless, which re results in high reliability and uh, 
they last long term as well. Okay. So there are situations where you need this. So several one megawatt R units are used for power quality control in installations around the world. What does this mean? You can provide one megawatt for one R, okay? Or you can provide two megawatts for half an R and so on. That's what that means. Okay. And what can you do with one megawatt? You can run a thousand US homes. So, okay, one kilowatt, a uh, uh, thousand watts, I'm using a low ball number, but a thousand watts is what you need to run your home. Okay. So with a megawatt, you can run a thousand homes for an hour, okay. Especially to provide power quality at manufacturing plants requiring ultra clean power such as microchip fabrication plants and stuff like that. So there are facilities where you would need this and they do use them. Yeah. And you can't live without, we can't live without our chips. Everything is electronic. Right. It all go crazy. A large SMES with a capacity of approximately 20 megawatt hour can provide 40 megawatts of power for a half an hour and so on. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so here is, uh, it's, uh, it's going to be a $100 billion industry. So this is, uh, there is a very need for it. And to compare that to flywheels, remember flywheels was only a $300 million industry. So with flywheels was very small. Yeah. This is a good application, so. Now, so right now, what they're using is either to keep the wires cold, to keep the wires cold, you use either liquid nitrogen, which costs about 10 cents per liter, or liquid helium, okay? And helium is expensive. That costs about $2 a liter, okay? So, to keep the wire cold to make it superconducting. What we hope is uh, if you can find uh, uh, something that becomes superconducting at room temperature or not that a uh, little below room temperature, then this cost would go down tremendously. And that's what this thing is about. So high temperature superconductors. Okay. But anyway. All right, so what all did we talk about? Storage. Storage is what we need, it's cheap storage. So we talked about pumped hydro. This is cheap, reliable, and uh, you know you just need the right geography. Compressed air. And this would be a good solution. You can compress air in tanks as big as this building and put them underwater. So for offshore winds, that will be a good solution. Okay. Is it easier to compress air underwater because of the pressure? No, well, uh, you, then the water is keeping the air compressed. So you're not spending any money to, you know, you know. And um, then we talked about SMES, expensive but good. and great, okay. and uh, flywheels, okay, these were the technology we talked about, yeah. Lithium ions are too expensive, but we'll talk about them next time, okay. We use them in cars and stuff like that because we're willing to spend, um, okay, your cars, you, when we get to the cars, do you guys know how much you get out of a car? When you get into a car, what is the bang for the buck you're getting? 20%. How efficient? Huh? Is it 20%? Okay. So you put in $100 and you get $20 of motion out of it. Okay. But what's your goal? Remember, I'm a 200 pound guy and I want to get from point A to B, and what did I do? 
I got into a 4,000 pound vehicle. So that's 400 is 10 percent. I am transporting 5 percent. You so you're really getting 5 percent of this thing. 5 percent of 20 dollars is uh, uh, one dollar. So for every hundred dollars you're spending, you're really getting only one percent of. That's right. Get in your car and enjoy your ride. <laughs> But, I mean, our life is, life is full of inefficiencies like this. See, she wouldn't come to class if, if it was too warm. To make her comfortable, tiny little person, we got to cool the whole building. <laughs> right? So, we, so if you could come up with a way to just blow cool air on her, you know, <laughs> that would be much more efficient. So, but 